I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. Today's episode, I'm joined by Brett Kugelmas. Brett is the founder and CEO of Last Energy, a company that builds nuclear modular reactors. This is a fascinating topic from an arsenal of democracy perspective because, as one thing has been made clear by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, energy security is key to national security. So moving forward, the question of what role will nuclear power play in our energy mix is critical. But as we also look to the future and new technologies, everything from EVs to artificial intelligence, it should be noted, of course, that the Three Mile Island reactor is reopened this past week because of the fact that Microsoft had needs for energy that had to do with powering their AI capabilities means that this entire topic will only gain more relevance moving forward. But very quickly, you can see that if we had tens of thousands coming off the assembly line at 20 megawatts, then a few years after that, tens of thousands coming off at a couple hundred megawatts, then maybe tens of thousands coming off the line at a couple gigawatts. Yeah, maybe we could not only transform all energy all energy on planet Earth to nuclear, but 10x that amount of energy too, such that we can satisfy the demand of the developing world. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Huge thanks to the Hudson Institute for supporting the work of Arsenal of Democracy. Brett Kugelmas, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Great to be uh, back talking to you, Marshall. This is an exciting time to talk about nuclear, the first time we've done this on this podcast for Hudson, because a lot of folks think of nuclear in the context of Three Mile Island. Well, from a news hit perspective, recently it was announced that Microsoft is going to be using and reopening the reactor at Three Mile Island to provide for its AI data needs. Can you just contextualize what that news means in the context of the recovery for the industry? Yeah, well, I I think at some point we can get into uh, maybe a heterodox perspective I have uh, stands counter to the rest of the industry on actually what was the downfall of the industry and what role Three Mile Island played. But undoubtedly, it's there's a lot of enthusiasm moving towards nuclear at this point. And the fact that you can have such big brand names such as Microsoft engaging in a facility that has had the worst, you know, reputation in the US, you know, regardless of, you know, the facts on the ground, clearly it's got the worst reputation. I think just shows how far we've come towards the overall macro nuclear tailwinds that are supporting and launching this industry forward. Can you give your we'll get into last energy in a second, but before we get into the, your background and bio, I'd love for you to tell your version of what's happened over the past five years. Because as a podcaster, I survey spaces, I look to narratives, and just the turnaround around nuclear has been such that if we were recording this in 2020, this would be somewhat of a heterodox. You obviously have heterodox takes on the space, but even the topic area would be considered heterodox in the first place. That's changed. So like from within the industry, because your company launched in 2019, tell your version of how you've seen that story play out. Yeah, and I mean, I got into the industry for the first time in 2017 when I launched you know, the Titans of Nuclear podcast in this sector, just to try to try to learn about you know, what were the challenges and opportunities of nuclear. And I mean, it it went from the narrative pretty clearly of we don't need it, so why even bother? And the why even bother? You know, there's there's several different undertones to that. Why even bother? Because we don't like it. Why even bother? Because it has so much extra complexity or complications or challenges. Or why even bother? Because you know it's just easier to throw your hands up in the air when something feels unfamiliar. So it went from why even bother to well now we need it. So let's figure out all the problems. And once it's kind of been established that it is needed, entrepreneurs maybe you could just call it capitalism itself comes out from the woodwork to start tackling those problems, whatever they may be, whether it be financing, the technology, constructability, timelines, regulatory policy. Once you like once it is known that it is needed, it gets a lot of help. 
So starting with a focus on the Three Mile Island reactor is going to give folks a sort of misconstrued perspective on Last Energy, your company, how your approach is different than the traditional approach. How about you contextualize what you are doing, given the sort of picture of what a nuclear reactor would typically look like? Yeah. So I think Last Energy stands somewhat in between the previous way of doing nuclear, the way that we know works with traditional proven technologies, something in between that and what are typically considered next generation nuclear, where there's some sort of technology unlock towards a new type of reactor, whether that be fuel type or coolant type or uh, you name it. I mean, passive safety systems. Uh, there's so many different strategies to consider something next generation, and we sit somewhere in between. So what we've decided to do was use only proven reactor physics, only existing fuel, only existing supply chain, but just reconfigure it in a different way in order to unlock the advantages of what you'd want from a next generation nuclear power plant without taking on any of the additional technical R&D risk associated with switching to a new material science, a new chemistry, a new coolant type, a new fuel type. So in short, our product is a 20 megawatt plug and play reactor that's buried underground, surrounded with 500 metric tons of steel, but is otherwise a traditional nuclear uh, reactor core using the traditional existing even full-length, full-sized fuel, just less fuel than a gigawatt-scale nuclear power plant. And a key thing to understand then the buried underground part, these are modular, these are smaller reactors than our typical image, correct? Yeah, so exactly. So everything nuclear, everything radioactive or that touches radioactivity in our system would be about the size of a school bus. So you can imagine digging a well, lining it with all of the steel, dropping it in and sealing it up, and then it's a set and forget it plug and play system. That's our technology. So let's understand how you got to the idea of, as you put it, this midpoint between the previous approach and the next generation approaches. If all this is possible given existing technology, why wasn't this modular approach the one that someone advanced from the first place? If you think about nuclear history, you know this very well. Feel free to educate me in the audience on this. But if you think of nimbyism and you think of the big, frankly, unattractive reactors in the first place, it seems that this in-between would be the ideal end state either way. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we feel. And that's why we're pursuing that business model. But you know, from a technology perspective, what I'm describing has been built a half dozen times before. They used to build a modular and, pl and plug and play even back in the 1960s, but it wasn't ever commercialized. It was used for powering an army base in, in Greenland or uh, experimental type reactors. And just nobody brought it to commercial fruition, partially because historically the only things that made sense – to bring into the commercial energy generation space were things that were large and had large capex because that's the way that the markets were designed up until the 90s. No utility was incentivized to build anything small. So even though there were a lot of, you know, Atomic Energy Commission, this is the former DOE, programs back in the day that paired with utilities to fund small build outs. You saw them in the middle of the country with Elk River. You saw them down in Puerto Rico. They built a small one also. You saw dozens of these experiments. There was no uh, commercial incentive to continue to build out that technology. So what we came along was we said, yeah, okay, well, when you build smaller, you don't get the economies of scale of size, but you can get those same economies of scale when you build many of the same thing. And so much of what we're doing that allows the unlock of this old technology is a new business model. And that business model is the same that Tesla applied. We're, while we are still at low volumes of production and our cost structure is higher, we're going to scour the world to find customers that for whatever their unique circumstances are willing to pay a higher price. Just like when Tesla came out with the Roadster, it was a much more expensive car, but they, uh, they geared it towards – um, ultra high net worth individuals that could take a chance and wanted something flashy. Then as they built more and more of them, they introduced the Model S, 
which because now that they're building more and more, they can offer it at a lower cost structure to a larger customer segment, and then all the way down to Model 3. So we're doing the same things. We've found customers that are willing to pay an extraordinary price for their electricity because of super high demand or carbon taxes or being in Europe where there are other uh, forces or being on an island like the UK where energy is just higher. And so we're charging them the highest while our our production volume is the lowest. And then as we increase our production volume, we'll bring down costs to open it up to new markets. And so, yeah, so it's an old technology, obviously with a new systems integration, systems configuration, and some new safety systems that we've thrown on top and a new strategy of dropping it underground, uh, but with really a new business model that makes this all work from an economics perspective. Beyond the aesthetic state of our country or anyone's country, what are the advantages of placing them underground from a deployment and just like your actual vision perspective? Well, uh, there aren't too many advantages. You have to you have to dig a big hole. But at the end of the day, the optics are better and it simplifies regulatory safety and licensing arguments if you drop it underground because you have all this built in shielding from the earth and that shielding is radiation shielding. Not that the radiation actually makes it out that far. But it is uh, also thermal shielding, and it's also kinetic shielding, right? The nuclear industry has become obsessed with this idea, what if something crashes into it? What if someone flies a plane into it, no matter how unlikely that is? Um, that still answers this question. So it's an elegant solution to a lot of things, a lot of arguments that people would throw against nuclear, even if it's not strictly necessary. Surrounded with 500 metric tons of metal, you could also put this thing above ground, and it would survive anything. I think what's interesting here is you alluded at the start, so you did some helpful signposting to the ways that we should really reimagine the story of Thumayo Island and the decline of the U.S. nuclear nuclear industry. So in a quick two-parter, could you articulate what the backlash to Thumayo Island did to the nuclear industry? And then how would you tell that story in a different way that could help us consider how we should move forward? Yeah. So uh, in 1979, we have Three Mile Island, which, you know, is branded as the largest nuclear disaster. Everyone loves to use the word disaster or catastrophe in, in American nuclear history, even though no one was hurt and no one conceivably could have been hurt by it. Well, that's interesting. And then everyone says, well, this was what brought the downfall of the nuclear industry. And so I actually flip this on its head based on what we've learned and what we've studied about the industry. Rather than Three Mile Island bringing about the downfall of the nuclear industry, it was or my heterodox perspective, is that it was actually the downfall of the nuclear industry that brought about Three Mile Island. And I don't mean the fact that the industry's downfall led to operational things that made Three Mile Island occur. It's the, like, why did we even care about an industrial accident that didn't hurt a single person and couldn't have really hurt a certain person based on how the accident occurred and the amount of radiation levels involved? Why did this become cemented in the public psyche as the worst possible disaster imaginable? And my argument, it's that because the nuclear industry had already died, right? There were at least 200 contracts, 100 of which were like signed, inked, and done for new reactors throughout the 70s. And all of them, all 200 of those, both the actual signed ink deals and another 100 that were like in early planning stage were canceled by 1978, the year before Three Mile Island. So already that disproves the fact that Three Mile Island and the idea of this led to the cancellation of all these projects because they are verifiably canceled before that event occurred. And so my theory is that- and to note as well too, listeners will be aware, that's also, you know, eight years before Chernobyl. So like at a, at a literal level, this 1978 um, date you're utilizing here is very key to understanding the story you're telling. That's exactly right. And so um, what happened from my perspective is that the industry um, was already looking for a new business model. And as many industries do, it's a lot easier to sell your product through fear than anything else. And so here you have it where there was this event that could create fear right, this Three Mile Island event, totally exaggerated in terms of the actual implications of environmental or human health. But nevertheless, it was a very useful sales tool. So the nuclear industry was already trying to sell safety systems, safety services, safety analysis. And that, by the way, they were already selling it 
in revenue figures that exceeded selling the original product, which was nuclear reactor cores. And so realizing that they could turn the Three Mile Island to a a new economic advantage by using, of course, regulatory capture, which Congress was easy to lean into, given that, you know, if all the news cycles are saying, hey, this Three Mile Island thing, you know, what politician wouldn't want to say, well, let's, yeah, apply higher regulatory scrutiny. And then the incumbents were well positioned to write what those rules would be to advantage their services business model. So that happened in 1979. Every single existing nuclear installation generated an extra $300 million worth of analysis Right? So these initial implementations, the nuclear part, was only in the $100 million range. Here, because of Three Mile Island mandated uh, regulatory scrutiny, mandated by Congress, uh, you were able, the same nuclear providers were able to generate an extra $300 million per facility. So this cemented in the new nuclear business model. And then again, another $300 million boost after Chernobyl, another $300 million boost after September 11th, and then another $300 million boost after Fukushima. It's a winning business model for the nuclear industry to take any accident, no matter how severe or not severe it is, and turn it into new rules that drive additional business to the nuclear services business model. A lot of policymakers listen to this podcast. So let's turn into uh, your sort of guest suggestions for policymakers to consider that segment. So as you made clear earlier in the podcast, the nuclear industry isn't perfectly a free market because of how much regulation and how much overall policymaking is going to come into it. What is then the proper regulatory approach to take to this industry now that we've transitioned from, well, who cares, which could be the 80s, 90s and 2000s version to no, we actually need this as a part of our energy mix. Like, What's the proper regulatory approach? In the U.S., I wouldn't even begin to, I mean, postulate. It's like when when the Nuclear Regulatory Commission got formed, this was a few years prior to Three Mile Island and why it was such a powerful tool for, uh, for regulatory capture. It got formed in a way, um, which is very unusual, by the way, where it is not responsive to the executive branch. It's what's called an independent agency. And so it is very, very difficult to have any reform because it's not really clear who they're accountable. Ostensibly, they're accountable to Congress, but Congress passes measures that insist on NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission reform, and five years go by, 10 years go by, and and nothing actually happens. So I'd be remiss to postulate exactly how regulatory reform should occur other than something like, you know, create a new agency or devolve the power to the states or you know something like that, or because the existing framework just doesn't work. Broadly speaking, then, and we'll get to the work y'all are doing worldwide. Let's say you are a country that is interested in developing an industry, is interested in a product like that created by Last Energy. How should one balance the fact that at the end of the day, no matter how safe the reactors are, this is just an incredibly fraught topic? Like, how have you just sort of encountered those conversations? Yeah. So, I mean, our business approach was to go after the lowest hanging fruit while we're still a you know, small company as we are. And so what we did was we looked around the world and said, you know, which countries have the matching, you know, Venn diagrams of having a regulatory pathway that's permissible, right? One that you can navigate, you know, from start to finish. You show, you know, your systems, you show the safety, they check, you know, uh, they check off on your license application that you can operate. So, you know, we needed to see that exist in certain countries countries. We needed the economics to be favorable in certain countries. And then we also wanted sustained social and political support. And so if you overlap those criteria, we ended up with four countries in Europe that met all those. And that's where we decided our early go-to-market would be. And then after we've demonstrated our system, we're a revenue-generating company, then we can go around and do what we need to do, either on the economic side, on the uh, regulatory side, or on the social and political support side to expand to additional markets. What are those countries? So the initial four countries uh, that we're working in are the United Kingdom, Netherlands, Poland, and Romania. I think what's particularly interesting about Poland, and this is what really changes this to the arsenal democracy theme of this podcast, is obviously post-22, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the 
problem, quote unquote, that the nuclear industry could solve when it comes to dependence on foreign and Russian sources of energy is just really key there. So talk about the Polish experience over the past few years and how the dynamics of geopolitics have shifted the general conversation there. Yeah. So early on when we were going to different countries to try to figure out where would be the right countries to go to, we went on a bit of like a multi-year long listening tour to really understand what what are the key problems in any given social and political and economic context of that country? And what we heard overwhelmingly throughout Europe was, you know, polite talk about climate change, you know, at the surface. But if you really drill down to what people care about, it's energy security. So even before the breakout of the war in Ukraine, our team out there, our team, you know, you call them a sales team, but it's like sales, it's government affairs. It's really aligning all the key stakeholders now necessary to move a project forward, we'd already switched our messaging to, hey, our product delivers energy security to your country, and we just dropped all the climate change talking points. And that proved to be quite prescient as once the war broke out, world leaders were calling up our team and saying, hey, can you get out here right now? We remember that thing that you were talking about, energy security, and boy, do we need it more than ever. I think something I'd love to hear. You gave a great articulation of the business vision. I could see that you're off of a fundraising round because I saw the pitch deck when you're describing Tesla and the Roadster and then the transition to the Model S from a how is this going to be a successful company perspective. But let's talk about the sort of lived experience version of your vision. Obviously, we're not going to live in a world where in 20, 30 years, all of our power is generated through nuclear energy. If you think about this vision you're building towards, so let's sort of skim to the end of the pitch deck. What is your vision for the role that nuclear, if a company such as yours can succeed, will play in our lives? Yeah, I mean, I dispute the fact that we can't have nuclear at those scales in the next few decades. Our goal as a as a company is to be delivering, is to have ramped up our manufacturing capabilities. Because remember, our product is a plug and play product about the size of a school bus. And so if you can imagine the factories that build similar devices, you can get up to the rate of tens of thousands per year that come off an assembly line. You know, a, a bus is a lot of metal and it's got a lot of complicated different systems that work together and needs a certain amount of you know, QA, QC associated with it. And clearly we have automobile factories that are able to produce tens of thousands per year. So we think once we get up to tens of thousands per year at our 20 megawatt size, we think that'll take about a decade if everything goes well, of course. And that, of course, means getting our first one online in the next few years, then building a factory a few years after that, and then parallelizing a factory a few years after that. Well, once we're building tens of thousands per year that are 20 megawatts, only then will we afford ourselves the luxury of scaling up in size. But very quickly, you can see that if we had tens of thousands coming off the assembly line at 20 megawatts, then a few years after that, tens of thousands coming off at a couple hundred megawatts, then maybe tens of thousands coming off the line at a couple gigawatts. Yeah, maybe we could not only transform all energy, all energy on planet Earth to nuclear, but 10x that amount of energy too, such that we can satisfy the demand of the developing world. Something I'm curious about when you are hearing the rosy side of the we're bringing Elon Musk's approach to nuclear energy, that would obviously get an investor excited. But anyone who investor or policymaker or otherwise who knows anything about this industry and just manufacturing in general knows that that's incredibly difficult. So you've taken two things, nuclear energy, manufacturing, they're both really tough. What have you sort of encountered at the intersection therein that's really the hard to solve problem beyond just like the obvious? Yeah, well, we're doing them one at a time. First, we're not going to build a – we're building a, a product that has designed for manufacturability in mind, but is not fully designed for high-throughput manufacturability. We're going to do one challenge first, and then we're going to take on the next challenge. And one of the reasons that this is feasible is because we're not doing what virtually every other new nuclear company is doing and layering on another challenge on top of that, which is redesigning the core itself, redesigning the fuel form factor, redesigning the materials and chemistry, we're not taking on that challenge. We're only using proven technologies sized at the appropriate scale and a custom systems integration to make it all work together. But those aren't 
particularly high risk technology efforts. It's more high risk from an execution. Can you build and lead and grow an engineering team that can accomplish these things more so than like, will it work, you know, once you actually uh, unveil your prototype? So many entrants into the nuclear space have focused on next generation technologies as a part of the pitch. I think if you read between the lines of what you're articulating here, part of what generates enthusiasm for the next generation take is the idea that this would be safer than the previous vision that people still fear um, for a variety of understandable and un understandable reasons. What do you think can be accomplished from a science and research perspective? So even if it's not your company, you also are interesting to speak to because you study the industry in general beyond just like your company interests, what do you think is either the promise or the pitfalls of investing in new generation technologies when it comes to this? Uh, I mean, listen, I don't want to speak ill of our competitors' approach because I really do think it's a rising tide floats all boats and any success they have is a success we have and, and vice versa. So I want to really encourage, even if it's a different strategy, I really want to encourage and 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 promote their growth as well. But Let me better the, state this. I'm yeah. asking Brett the podcaster, not Brett the CEO. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Brett the podcaster and not Brett the CEO pretty much says there's a chicken and the egg problem um, that is particularly acute to nuclear when it comes to developing, you know, fundamentally different technologies. And that is unless you have empirical data on how every physical characteristics of your that system performs, um, regulators aren't going to let you build it. And if you can't build it, how do you get that data? And so a lot of people try to do these test apparatuses that show one characteristic of the new system at a time, run hot molten salt, but without the nuclear component, except you can only get so far in your data gathering activities to when you present it to a regulator and they say, yeah, but what happens if this molten salt is a, a, in a neutron field? Or what about extra corrosion factors or gas buildups or you know, local turbulences? Or I mean, any one of a number of things that can break down any mechanical physical system. And then the startups go back to them after spending hundreds of millions of dollars and a couple of years later and say, but wait, you told us that we can't actually make it a real reactor in, until you know, we get a license to do so. And you're not letting us get a license. In, in so it's a, it's a giant chicken and the egg. And then the regular says, not my problem. That's what the regulator says. So that's happened throughout time. I can show you graveyards of startups that have failed over the last startups and also big industry incumbents that have tried that approach over the course of decades. And every single time after spending hundreds of millions of dollars, they get to the same place. The regulator says, we don't have enough data to support uh, giving you a license. And, and the startup says, well, we can't get that data until we get the license. And that's where it always ends after decades of trying. That's the Brett Podcaster uh, answer for you. <laughs> Not speaking on behalf of Last Energy for that quick clip, noting that for everyone listening. I think the follow-up then that's really interesting here is you specified, and you weren't just speaking about startups, but you talked about startups. I'm always fascinated by the structural nature of how companies and new ideas are generated. So this comes up when you're talking to defense tech startups. The basic question is, why can't one of the primes do this? Why can't Raytheon do this? Why can't Lockheed Martin do this? Obviously, to your point earlier, there are market incentives for existing nuclear incumbents to focus more on the safety dynamic and that business model you discussed earlier. But let's just say in a perfect world or a 90% as good as we can get world to be a little more realistic. Are startups best equipped to do this? Or is this best equipped by like a big company with big capital that doesn't have to raise money from venture capitalists? How do you think about that dynamic? Yeah, clear, clearly, if you could get the best of both worlds, I think we'd unlock innovation at a new pace across many different industries. And I don't think anyone has quite cracked the cookie on that idea of like entrepreneurship. How does a big company that's well-resourced and all the incentives 
in any given space to launch forward? How do they get out of their own way and create like an internal framework that is allowed to fail fast, is allowed to act like a startup, is allowed to pivot very quickly? Um, it's it's a tough challenge. I don't I don't know if anyone's quite solved it. And so what you typically find instead are over the course of decades, you know, enough startups try enough things that the incumbents and all the barriers and moats that they put in their place, you know, one or two are able to sneak through. And then you have the incumbents saying, well, I want to do that. And then there's a fast follow and rewriting of the rules and innovation happens across the sector. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I think what's interesting here, and this is where we can go back to the useful part of the Three Mile Island reopening. If we were having this conversation in even 2022, we would be focused on not just the Russia conversation, but also just the whole idea of America needs to diversify its energy mix. There's a lot of interest for it, both at the executive branch and the congressional level in this. However, the AI story and the AI aspect of the Three Mile Island part is so interesting because this is just a whole new um, energy usage um, context that's, that's emerged here. Um, I'd be curious if you think there are other, or you could talk about AI if you want, other just additional loads we're going to need to bear from an energy perspective that don't make this just as simple as, okay, we're going to basically need to meet our existing needs and how we design energy policy, they, I think, just means that like there's this whole other new massive behemoth that we need to deal with here. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, the two that, that come up the most are AI and then like electric vehicles as the new, new needs uh, for energy. And then I would also add on there just any country that is growing, right, that has a population growth or is growing from a developing country into a developed country. And isn't it magical how how like you know it's like the whole expression like necessity is the mother of invention. The the minute that we really need a surge in, in new power here, all the big Fortune 500 companies are like, oh, of course we should consider nuclear. Whereas when electricity was pretty con, demand was constant or even decreasing, mostly due to efficiencies. Um, they were very reluctant to to um, to throw their their hat in the nu- in the nuclear ring. Uh, but but here here we are. Uh, they need more power, and so everyone's changing their tune. Interestingly enough, separate from the Three Mile Island revisionism, at a bare minimum, there is just going to be, there's reluctance to put any form of energy anywhere, separate from safety concerns. How do you think moving forward, any energy producer, any EV battery plant deployer, um, any manufacturer, how should we think about the need to sort of meet the moment, despite the fact there are going to be local incentives against deployment? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's a big mystery. I think it's a mystery absolutely nobody has figured out. And this is why there's been so much emphasis recently in the last couple of years. The narrative has switched towards, hey, we need permitting reform. Permitting reform more broadly is something akin to the solution to this problem, not just for uh, nuclear, not just for energy, but for all infrastructure. How do we get faster from the point of, hey, I want to do something in the physical world to overcoming all of these processes that we've intentionally set up to slow down the I want to do things in the physical world. So for the last big question here, you have just raised your Series B for Last Energy. Congratulations. Thank but you. So we, we always spend time saying, and I, I think you'll appreciate this as a founder who's also interested in policy. My big takeaway from discussing these things with founders who have raised money is if you look at so much of our problems in D.C., we'll basically pass money for legislation. So we'll pass the CHIPS Act and say we're you know committing billions of dollars to create semiconductor fabs in the U.S., but as we learn, there's a difference between sort of allocating money and actually deploying on the ground, so we should really focus on that. So when I talk to a founder, I don't want to just make it seem like, congratulations, Series B, you're good to go, everyone's check back in with Brett in five years. Um, talk about like where you go from here and what potential challenges the Series B has equipped you to actually um, surmount and approach. Yeah. So, well, the raise actually happened you know, earlier this year, so we're already well on our way to um, surmounting some of these challenges. And it's mostly progress just along the lines that we've already articulated that we're going to make towards our, you know, what we hope to be a pretty near-term vision of getting our first power plant online in just the next few years. So this money is going to, you know, help us obviously, you know, fund overhead and staff count and continue to grow and fill all the roles that we need to do to handle the, you know, hundred different things that we're working on for 
from you know development activities to commercial activities to technical activities to regulatory and licensing activities. So it's to fund headcount growth. It's to build out a couple new prototypes to kind of you know show slow and steady progress along that way. It's to pay licensing fees. These licensing fees, even in the European markets, are very expensive and very time consuming. So we need to apply more resources there. Um, and then uh, just you know overall growth and continued development in general, buying some land. That's another thing that we're going to allocate capital towards, land to actually build our physical units on in our target locations. I'd be really curious, for an, as much as you can talk about this, when it comes to anything intersecting with government, investors tend to be reluctant because of regulatory risk. Your model, as you articulated this, is selling in different countries, across different systems. What is your response to folks who basically say, okay, so not only is it difficult to do these things in the United States, but it'd be conceivably difficult to do these in all these other different countries. How do you think about um, answering the regulatory question? My goal is to solve the correct problem, whether that problem you know, for any business, whether that problem would be technology or regulatory or commercial, like identify what has been the thing that has been holding that industry back and then you know, create a new opportunity by solving the correct problem and not rationalizing why the problem that you want to solve is the correct problem. And so that would, is my main critique across so many other endeavors in this sector is you know, people start off with a cool technology. They start off with their PhD thesis or you know, their co-founder's PhD thesis or if they're a nuclear professor, that's what they've been working on this time and say, well, the whole problem with the nuclear industry is we need less waste or the whole problem is, you know, we need higher temperatures. And then that becomes the justification for what business they always wanted to create. But for us, you know, we identified the problem was really kind of pairing the right business model with an existing technology in a permissive regulatory environment. And so, yes, it is difficult and unique and unfamiliar to many investors. But I you know, convince them first that I'm solving the correct problem and then that we are doing the right things to solve that problem. And that's the pitch at the end of the day. I want to close with this question. So to be clear for accountability's sake, I pitched you to come on this podcast. You didn't pitch me. So I'm not speaking about you when I'm describing this, but oftentimes a bit of frustration I have as we start to get more guest pitches from deep tech, hard tech, defense tech minded startups is they'll describe a policy problem and say something like, look at the war in Ukraine. That shows that the US and our European allies cannot be reliant on Russian energy. That's why we need to do X, Y, or Z um, company, which sounds great, but at a narrative level, the kind of problem here is the actual timeline. So as you discussed today, you pointed out, like in you know 2026, you're looking to start deploying. If you had pitched me this podcast in 2022, I would nod and say, that's a really great point around over-dependence on Russian en energy. But what you're saying to me here is we're not going to be able to do this for a few years. So in between, there's going to be this real serious policy problem we need to really worry about. So now that I've made clear that this isn't a dig at you, I'd be curious how you just think of timeline when it comes to the overall vision of reducing dependence on hostile Russian energy in general, because it's, once again, not a contradiction with you, but it's just sort of an uncomfortable reality that comes to mind when we talk about the ability of business and tech to solve, like, on the face of things, uh, policy problems. It's totally. And um, that's why I try to resist the urge of what you just said, which is kind of like pairing a, a near term problem that everyone feels very viscerally with a long term solution. Just say, hey, like, sorry, that's not our business. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve a lot of long term problems. You know, we're trying to solve the problem of how do you decouple, you know, energy from its impact on the environment over the long term. We're trying to solve the problem of how do we give everyone across the world the same standard of living living that we have in the Western world. We're trying to solve the problem of poverty. We're trying to solve the problems of air pollution. We're trying to solve the problems of climate change, but we're not actually solving any short-term problems. Sorry, that's just, that's it. And I think a good way to then tie this together is the actual policymaker response is 2022 over dependence on Russian energy is the result of 30 years of bad <laughs> public policy yeah. that culminates in that really crescendo focused moment. But 
I think you did a great job of separating your ability to solve 30 years of policy in a very specific time frame from this longer term vision of 30 years of policy that goes the actual right direction moving forward. So, Brett, this has been really great, really informative, and I really appreciate your ability to wear the hats both as a you know, obviously like interested party when it comes to being the founder of a company, but also the fact that you're just obsessed with this topic. So can you just give a quick shout out um, to your podcast for folks who would like to learn more about your work in the space? Sure. We actually have two. There's uh, Titans of Nuclear, which we started to, you know, uh, we started, oh my God, almost seven years ago at this point in order to really do a deep dive in the sector and try to uncover what the real problems to solve were. So we talked to, you know, policymakers, uh, we talked to technologists, we talked to industry, we talked to startups, we talked to, you know, uh, people at universities, you know, and all across different, um, all across different countries to see the history of nuclear as well. So that's called Titans of Nuclear. And we also have a second podcast as well, which is called Energy Impact Podcast, where we're still trying to like learn the lessons that we can apply to the nuclear industry, but we're approaching it in a very energy industry agnostic way such that we can learn from others without them thinking, oh, I don't know anything or want to talk to anyone about nuclear. So we've got dual track podcasts, both for learning and hopefully along the way we communicate some useful things to other people too. Awesome. Brett, thank you for bringing an energy focus to Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you, Marshall. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.